Our scripture reading this morning comes from Galatians 3, verse 25 through 29. And it's found on page 1,248 in your pews, Bibles. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Matt, for the prayer and for your reading. Before I forget, um, I was given a picture. We all have different gifts to bring, and uh, the, uh, the young people who profess their faith are discovering their gifts and ways that they can use them. And uh, some of you know Don Vanderhyde, one of our members here, and Don shared a beautiful picture uh, with us, so I'm just going to put it there at the front. He asked me if I could share that with everybody, so I'm going to do that. So that's going to sit right there. And uh, if you see Don after the service, uh, thank him for, his, for sharing his artwork with us, okay? These young adults who made their profession of faith here this morning said something incredibly profound about themselves. When, when they stood here, they were not simply saying that they believed some things or that they knew some facts and understood those, those statements intellectually. They were saying that they were publicly taking upon themselves the identity of a disciple of Jesus Christ. They accepted the calling of Jesus Christ to all of his disciples throughout all of the ages, including us. They said yes to Jesus' call to take up your cross, deny yourself, and to follow him. They said yes to Jesus' call to, to go and make other disciples. They said yes to Jesus' call to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. They said that that was their identity and their calling. And they reminded us that it's our identity and our calling. They accepted the gracious promises that God made to them in their baptism. They were, in a sense, saying that that identity and that calling were the most important thing about them. It isn't the job that they'll have in the future. It's not where they'll go to school. It's about following Jesus Christ in whatever they do, wherever they do it. No matter what their secondary callings turn out to be, they are first and foremost disciples of Jesus. And so are we. For some people... <clears throat> It's one of the reasons they struggle so mightily when there's a, a career change or maybe a job loss or a retirement from a career because they've, they've tied themselves to that identity too tightly, too closely. Maybe when a relationship ends or an institution that we identify ourselves with disappoints us. Those kinds of experiences are challenging enough when we face them in life, and, but when we found our identity and our calling in other, anything other than as followers of Jesus, we will inevitably be disappointed. Those, those kinds of experiences might be very difficult even if we are clear about our calling and identity as disciples of Jesus. But if we're clear about that primary calling, then there will be this, this solid core that isn't shaken by those difficulties and those challenges. We'll know that our identity and our calling are steady and secure. 
because they're not affected by those changes, even big changes in our lives. They're rooted in the promises of God in Jesus Christ. These young people were also acknowledging that they had learned a lot and that they're not finished learning. They're on a road, a lifelong journey of discovering more deeply what it means to follow Jesus. And so are we. You see, when when someone professes their faith, as these young people did this morning, they're not just professing a personal faith. They're, They're saying, yes, I personally believe these things, But they're not just professing a personal faith. They're professing the faith of the church. They're saying that they're part of something bigger than just themselves. And we profess that along with them. Maybe some takeaways from this morning are a a commitment to our ongoing growth. Just as these young people committed to their ongoing growth ongoing growth, and, and also a commitment to, to continue to pray for them as we promised in their baptism. But that we commit to something more than just our personal faith. It's the faith of the church. When Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians to the believers there, he says, in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God. That is a profound statement for a number of reasons. But he says there's a universality here. Like he says this includes all of us. You are all sons of God. And the fact that he uses that phrase to identify these believers in Galatia, all of them, you are all sons of God, might seem strange if you know the background of that phrase. I mean, we hear that that phrase and our ears might be inclined to, by our culture and our background, to think it excludes. By sons, it can't possibly also mean women. But Paul is saying he's applying this to all the believers in Galatia. You are all sons of God. Now, that's a loaded phrase in in the background that Paul has and where he comes from. That's a loaded phrase. What he's saying by saying you are all sons of God, he's including everyone. And he uses that phrase sons of God for a very specific reason. As As a Pharisee, by his background, Paul would have at one time understood that phrase to mean a very specific, very narrow group of people. He would have understood that to refer to Jewish males. And maybe even more specific than that, he would have understood it to refer to Jewish males who were part of his group, the Pharisees, the ones who were committed to interpreting the law as as precisely as they could and following it as carefully as they could And making sure that everybody else did the same. And if they didn't, letting them know that they they weren't part of that group. They weren't sons of God. But now Paul, the former Pharisee, is saying that phrase applies to all of us. Paul takes that term sons of God and he applies it to Gentiles. In Galatia, not just Gentiles, but both men and women and and people who hadn't received the law of Moses the way the people of Israel had and the way the, the Pharisees had interpreted it. He says that they are all sons of God. Not because they're Jewish, not because they're male, not because they were Pharisees, but only because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Throughout the letter to the Galatians, 
Paul is at pains to, to show these believers that their faith is the core of who they are. Paul writes, after this, these churches in this area of Galatia, these churches that Paul wrote to were churches that he helped establish on his first missionary journey. And, but after Paul had been through there preaching the gospel of grace, that it was only through faith in Jesus Christ that not only Jews, but also Gentiles were saved. When, after he had established these churches, other people came in after him, a group known as the Judaizers. And, and they said, that's all well and good to, to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one, that he died on the cross to save us from sin. But in addition to believing in him and in believing in what he's done for you, you have to also, in a sense, become Jewish, receive the sign of circumcision, and, and follow some of the other ceremonial laws and, and Paul wrote to these Galatians when he heard of the trouble this, this other group was causing these churches. He wrote to them. And, and he said, there are no add-ons to the Christian faith. This, this isn't some bait and switch. It's not as if you, you say, oh, it's my faith in Christ. But after you accept that, and then you have to do these other things too. Paul's not doing that. Paul's saying there are no add-ons to Christ's finished work on the cross. That's the end of the statement, period. Paul says no. He's, he's saying to the Galatians and to us, when you, were, when you accept and declare your faith in what Christ has done for you, he's saying they were clothed with Christ. They were clothed with his perfect righteousness in God's eyes, and his identity as the Father's beloved. They were called to follow him, not to look to any other identity or to try and work to achieve their own righteousness before God. Through faith, those things were all gifts to them. Paul says there's no other identity. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, he says. There is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. In Christ, we are one. We are clothed with Christ. Now, that might just seem like another illustration that Paul uses, that we're clothed with Christ. But in that day and age, in that culture, it would have been very specific. It would have meant something specific to the people who heard it. In that culture, and, and to some extent this is true even today, but in that, in that time you could identify people's social position by the clothes they wore. When you, know, when you see pictures of people from the first century in, in Paul's time, maybe you see some people wearing you know, a flowing white toga. Those those were not clothes that were designed for a person who did manual labor every day. Right? Those were, those were clothes that were designed to convey some, a message to the people around them. I mean, one, it was, it was fine fabric. And it said to, the per, it said to everybody around them, I have enough money that I can afford to buy clothes like this. And not only that, it said that my work, if I work at all, is, is such that I don't have to worry about getting dirty. I don't have to worry about this, this flowing toga that's wrapped around me getting caught and ripped and torn. And if I did, well, I'd just buy another one anyway because I've got the resources to do that. Manual laborers in, in this day would have worn much more functional clothing that wouldn't get in their way while they were working. I mean, and, and to some extent, we have the same thing today, right? We have, you know, there are certain labels on, you know, on clothing or handbags or cars or whatever it might be that 
convey something to the people around us. Now, we might not, that might not be our intention necessarily, but people see a label and they, they make an association with it right away. And, and that's, that's what Paul is saying when, when you're clothed in Christ. It makes an association to those around you. I mean, we, in our day and age, we, if we see somebody in, in coveralls and work boots and sitting on a tractor, we can pretty safely assume that they're what? A farmer, good. Either that or a politician trying to court votes. But, I mean, if you, if you see somebody dressed like that, you assume it's a farmer. And you're probably right. Or if you see somebody in a, you know, in a suit and tie, you probably don't assume that they're a farmer, or at least that maybe they're a farmer on Sunday uh, coming to church. But you, you associate different kinds of clothing with different kinds of callings and identities. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul's saying that you've been clothed with Christ. And that that should convey something to those around you. That tells people around you about your identity and your calling. Christ's righteousness and character is or should be how we're identified. And it's because of that being clothed with Christ that we're sons of God. Paul says just a couple verses later on that we're also... Abraham's seed. Again, to say, to say that about Gentiles is pretty remarkable. We're Abraham's seed. We're, we're, we're descended from Abraham. Maybe not genetically or physically, but spiritually. And we're heirs of those promises that God made to his people. And he says to these Galatians, no one who's been clothed in Christ is excluded. Not women, not Gentiles, not slaves. No one. No one who's made mistakes. Not people who have a past. Not people with deep wounds or scars or continuing struggles. No one. God's grace in Jesus Christ forgives our sin, heals our wounds, changes our futures so that they aren't determined by our past. The good news of the gospel is that there is forgiveness and newness of life for all who are in Christ. Not because of what we do or don't do or who we are or aren't, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and because of who he is. And that's true not just for us, but for all those that God is calling to himself. For all those who don't yet know Jesus and have a relationship with him. Grace transforms our relationship with God, but also with other people. Whatever differences there are between individuals and groups, we see people as being loved by God and called into a relationship with Jesus. And we, because of that, we don't want to put boundaries around God's grace, but instead keep it at the center and, and be about the work of calling people, all people, to receive God's grace and to be changed and transformed by it so that we follow Jesus more faithfully each day. And I hope that Grace Church really truly is and becomes more what our name says. A church of grace. A place of belonging and love where we're grateful for the gift that we've been given and where we boldly profess our faith 
where we boldly point to Jesus Christ, where, we're, where we stand with Cameron and Cindy and Megan and Alex, and where we say yes to Jesus, where we're clothed with his love and righteousness, and where we invite others to that kind of life, where we celebrate together and give God thanks and praise for all he's done and where we faithfully and joyfully do the work he's called us to do together as one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Good and loving God, we thank you for the simple good news of the calling and identity we have in Jesus Christ. That in him we are forgiven, in him we are made righteous, in him we are called to share that good news with those around us. We thank you today for the specific way in which Cameron and Cindy and Megan and Alex said that. We thank you for the way that you have worked in their hearts and lives to bring them to this point. We thank you that they have said yes to you. And may they continue each and every day to say yes to you. And may we all say yes each new day. Yes to your grace. Yes to your righteousness, yes, to sharing in that mission. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.